different types of parameters described in the standard. Uh, they're coded by letters. And these parameters will basically give you a good overview of what the framing is going to be. And I grouped them into two sets. The set on the left here uh, is basically the relating to the data, right? So you have physical converters, which are the ones that are underlined are the physical aspects of the system. So you have M converters in your system that are uh, transmitting S samples, which is uh, oversampling. So you could have one or more uh, per frame, samples per frame from a converter. So this one is logical, but the resolution of the converter is again a hard, hard parameter. So your converters will be sampling data at a specific resolution, unless you do some processing on them. And uh, those uh, converter samples can be accompanied by control bits. So these control bits are uh, additional sideband information, I would say, pertaining to the samples, like over range, under range, sample valid, uh, whatever you actually want. These are not defined by the standard, but the standard just allows you to sort of uh, carry them in the frame. And then they're uh, packed into these N prime containers, which are nibble extensions of the data plus control. And uh, here on the bottom, you can see the uh, data sample with a uh, two, two bits of control and two bits of padding because it's extended to 16 bits. This is nibble extension. So it's expanded into a container of multiple of four bits. And then the framing, so this data that you have that you want to transmit has to be put onto the lanes in some way. So framing is, uh, there are several parameters for that. One of them is L, which indicates how many lanes in a link you have from one up to uh, as many as you support. Um, F is the number of octets in a frame. And I'll have a framing example on the next slide so you can get a good picture of how this works. Then there's uh, K and E, which are sort of a um, bigger framing structure indicators for 204B. We used K to indicate how many frames there are in the multi-frame. And in 204C, how many blocks there are in the multi-block. It's a similar, similar concept. And then finally, some mapping uh, indications for high density mode and uh, a control word at the end of the frame. And I'll show some uh, examples now. So uh, if you can see here, the, there are different sort of uh, pictures of different uh, frames as examples. Sorry. And we'll have, here we'll have on the rows, where's the cursor here? On the rows, we'll have, we'll have lanes. So there are four lanes in the first example. And then each uh, column denotes a octet, so eight bits. So there's eight bits uh, here as octets. So before we had uh, the data example of uh, n equal to 12, right? So there's 12 bits of uh, sample, followed by two bits of control and two bits of padding to form a 16-bit container. And JSD will take this data structure that was on the previous slide and basically split it up into lanes. So it maps the data sort of in uh, this direction and then moves over to the next lane and snakes through all the lanes placing the data. So here you can see four lanes, four frame, four octets per frame, not high density mode and uh, not control this at the end of the frame. And here a similar example with the same data where you have again four lanes four octets per frame, you are using high density mode. And that means that you can split a sample between two lanes. So this part is actually here, right? It, it gets mapped and then split. And CF equal to one means you'll take all of your uh, control bits and place it into a container at the end of the frame. So this way, these both the both of these mappings are the same physical sort of thing, just placed differently inside of the frame. And if you would have uh, less lanes in your system, three lanes in this example, you would use a wider frame. So uh, there's uh, actually five octets here. And high density mode again, and the control bits are at the end of the frame. So CF equal to one. And you can see this uh, sample is again split. But what if you don't want to split your samples across lanes and you say HD mode is equal to zero? You can also map that. But then again, this uh, padding that exists here will be actually um, placed where you cannot map a sample 
because HD mode equal to zero means you cannot split samples between consecutive planes. And finally, in this last example, I just did a drawing of uh, what happens if you have six lanes. You could probably map this into five lanes uh, and just have some, uh, if you use uh, CF equal to zero, CF equal to one, but if you don't want to put the control bits at the end and you want to have them together with the samples, then this is how the frame would look. So moving to a second out of three slides on uh, the standard specifics, deterministic latency, which I alluded to before, basically is a feature introduced in the B version of the standard where um, you would maintain a constant latency from the data coming into the system in the TX and exiting in the RX, which is very useful for certain types of applications. And we achieved, achieved this uh, feature by the use of a system reference signal called sysref. So we can see here, these are the graphs uh, the, for the TX and for the RX here. In the TX, we have a sysref uh, pulse. It's usually a pulse. It can be a higher duty cycle pulse as it have to be a one clock. Basically, the system will detect the rising edge. And from that rising edge, it will form its own uh, local multi-frame clock. And the TX would request data on, on this uh, multi-frame clock based on the sysref. So basically, this time from uh, the sysref appearing to the data entering the system is your uh, known time, constant known time, right? So you measure everything relative to the sysref. And on the RX, the same thing. You get a rising edge on the sysref. You generate your uh, local multi-frame clock, which uh, dictates the timing. And then the lanes will appear maybe with some skew between them because of uh, different factors. And they'll be placed into something called the desk queue buffer, something that realigns them uh, or removes the skew. And because uh, we want to have deterministic latency, then we will take data out of that desk queue buffer at a known point in time which is basically uh, dictated by this uh, local multi-frame clock, plus uh, some RBD, in this case, one Rx buffer delay, where you can control uh, from this reference how far in time, later in time, you want to release the buffer. So here you can see these, uh, uh, this data from the desk queue is released. And if we measure from here to here, we also have some uh, fixed time, and then some fixed time plus some LMFC uh, times and or whatever, uh, some number of multi-frame clock periods. And this uh, allows us to know exactly or maintain a constant latency in the system. Uh, we can measure how much it will take, but we know that from every reset to every reset or reinitialization, the latency stays the same. And some different types of system architectures throughout the time progression of the standards. We had the 204 where you had a single link connecting uh, M converters to a logic device. Then in the A version, we had a multi-point link established. So a link would have L lanes and you could com connect multiple converters to a logic device. And you could see the A standard is still shared the same clock. But in the B and the C and later on the D as well, these clocks are separate, separated, so you actually provide different clocks to each. And if you want this deterministic latency, you will provide this to both. And uh, another aspect is uh, maybe you're wondering how to maximize the bandwidth of your links, if you're putting in several links, then uh, to achieve the highest possible bandwidth is basically you want to fill the frame, the GSD frame, as much as possible, so you avoid these tail bits in the framing. You you probably want to use high density mode, so so that you pack as much of the data as possible. And when using control bit, control bits and uh, these don't fit well into nibble extensions, you probably want to put them at the end of the frame, maybe to to avoid tail bits again, depending on what your sample size is. <clears throat> 